History as it happens, June 3rd, 2021, Biden's foreign policy. America is back. America is back. Diplomacy is back at the center of our foreign policy. After four years of Trump's America first, the new president is setting his own agenda as he juggles a bunch of problems. Afghanistan, North Korea, Russia, Iran, Gaza, the southern border with Mexico. Presidencies often succeed or fail on the handling of foreign affairs. So what awaits Biden? That's next as we report history as it happens. A podcast from The Washington Times. I'm Martin DeCaro. One of the primary objectives of the foreign policy of the United States is the creation of conditions in which we and other nations will be able to work out a way of life free from coercion. There can be no stable and enduring peace without the participation of the People's Republic of China and its 750 million people. The maxim is dovii no provii, trust but verify. (laughs) Because of this deal, the international community will be able to verify that the Islamic Republic of Iran will not develop a nuclear weapon. Every American president hopes to shape events to his advantage. But events have a way of shaping presidencies, especially the unforeseen or what might have been seen if proper attention been paid. Whatever the case, how leaders respond to problems, whether of their own making or not, is what determines their place in the history books. Just think of Jimmy Carter and the Iran hostage crisis. As our team was withdrawing after my order to do so, two of our American aircraft collided on the ground following a refueling operation in a remote desert location in Iran. Or Ronald Reagan and Iran-Contra. We did not, repeat, did not trade weapons or anything else for hostages, nor will we. That was in 1986. Uh, This was in 1987. A few months ago, I told the American people I did not trade arms for hostages. My heart and my best intentions still tell me that's true. But the facts and the evidence tell me it is not. And then there was Bill Clinton and Black Hawk Down in Somalia. We all reacted with anger and horror as an armed Somali gang desecrated the bodies of our American soldiers and displayed a captured American pilot, all of them soldiers who were taking part in an international effort to end the starvation of the Somali people themselves. Okay, let's go back in time. John Kennedy and the Cuban Missile Crisis. Within the past week, unmistakable evidence has established the fact that a series of offensive missile sites is now in preparation on that imprisoned island. Kennedy came out of that one okay. Uh, Lyndon Johnson and Vietnam, uh, a different story. It is the arena where communist expansionism is most aggressively at work in the world today. Johnson's fateful decision to send in the Marines in 1965 ultimately destroyed his presidency. And then there was George W. Bush and 9-11. Our war on terror begins with al-Qaeda. But it does not end there. It will not end until every terrorist group of global reach has been found, stopped, and defeated. George Bush squandered immense amounts of international goodwill by declaring an open-ended war against anyone the U.S. deemed an enemy. And his decision to invade Iraq, abetted by a coterie of neoconservative hawks, produced utter disaster in the Middle East. A disaster whose fallout the current president still has to deal with. Joe Biden, like many presidents before him, is inheriting a host of geopolitical challenges. Let's make a partial list. Number one, the aforementioned two decades of war in the greater Middle East, although he has already decided to pull out of Afghanistan. Number two, the ongoing conflict between Israel and the Palestinians. Number three, China. I mean, where do we even begin? The origins of COVID-19, the trade war, the South China Sea, Hong Kong, Taiwan, the Uyghur Muslims. How about Russia? Biden has a summit with Vladimir Putin coming up. And there is the task of repairing the relationship with our European allies. Plus the issue of Central American migrants at the border, North Korea's missiles, the Iran nuclear accord, 
and something we can't talk about today because it hasn't happened yet. It is the unforeseen. You can be near certain that something somewhere in the world is going to happen before Biden leaves office. It may prove minor, it may derail his presidency, or Biden could make what you might call an unforced error. He could create a calamity where none exists, a la Kennedy and the Bay of Pigs, or any number of other foreign policy fiascos in our recent past. At this hour, American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. The so-called Bush Doctrine. Four years from now, will we be talking about a Biden doctrine? You know, when Harry Truman addressed Congress in 1947, asking for funds to help Greece and Turkey, he established the policy of containment, containment of communism. It is necessary only to glance at a map to realize that the survival and integrity of the Greek nation are of grave importance in a much wider situation. If Greece should fall under the control of an armed minority, the effect upon its neighbor Turkey would be immediate and serious. Confusion and disorder might well spread throughout the entire Middle East. This developed into the Truman Doctrine, based in part on the so-called domino theory. President Eisenhower was actually the first one to refer to the dominoes. It is cunning. It is godless. It aims to destroy all freedom. We withdrew from Vietnam. The communists would control Vietnam. Pretty soon, Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, Malaya would go. If this little nation goes down the drain and can't maintain her independence, ask yourself what's going to happen to all the other little nations. Historians disagree over just how important the domino theory was when it came to getting involved in Vietnam. But back to the Truman Doctrine. It was the foreign policy of the United States throughout the Cold War. But it was a bipolar world then. The situation's a lot different today, as a man born during World War II asserts his own foreign policy. And that would be Joe Biden. And here to talk about the challenges we can see is the Washington Times' Guy Taylor. He's been covering world affairs for the Times for 10 years, and he's the paper's national security team leader. Guy Taylor, welcome back. Hi, Martin. How are you? It's great to have you in studio, all vaccinated and everything. Right. I'm happy to be here. Are you looking forward to traveling for work again? You know, that was really the most fun part of this prior to the pandemic was that I wear the sort of dual hat of being the chief foreign correspondent. Uh, At the times we have all these stringers around the world. But I get to travel around to uh, geopolitical hotspots, so to speak, and report from on the ground a few times a year, usually. And yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to uh, hopefully doing some of that in the next year or so. So, Mr. Taylor, every new president wants to form his own foreign policy. In this case, Joe Biden may also want to reverse some aspects of his predecessor's foreign policy, Donald Trump and America First. So before we get into some individual areas of the globe, let's talk broadly. What is Joe Biden's foreign policy and how far along is he in forming it? I think it's actually still very much in formation. The number one thing we can see is that he puts U.S. allies first. And out of the gate, his first major trips have been Anthony Blinken's first major trips, the Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken. These trips have been to Japan. They've been to South Korea. They've been to NATO, to European allies, to try and immediately show countries around the world that there's stability in in Washington, that even though the pendulum has swung so much ideologically and politically here, that the Biden administration is stable and that the U.S. stands up for its allies. That's really the, the number one characteristic. As far as the rest of it goes, it's been totally reactionary including with things like trying to bring back the Iran nuclear deal. That's an initiative. He wants to put diplomacy first, diplomacy, diplomacy. Uh, But it's been reactionary, and I say that in that it's been responding to crises. And that's similar to what, what went on to a degree with Trump. It happens to any American president, regardless of the domestic politics that's in the true. U.S. So that's that's really where we are. The second thing that, in just brief on that, is the administration wants to stand up for human rights. That could be tricky. It it absolutely can be tricky because the U.S. has partners of convenience around the world, alliances of convenience around the world, including with some countries with pretty bad human rights records. So 
That being said, the administration has tried to stand up for human rights or at least put that rhetoric out. And uh, we'll see where where that ultimately leads. Presidents are also inheriting messes of their predecessors or just inheriting intractable problems. So we're going to start with an episode that was just in the news, Israel and Gaza. The Biden administration is looking to return to a more neutral posture in that conflict. Is that right? Uh, Yeah, I I think so. But, you know, I'm coming at this as somebody who's spent a lot of time or relatively a bunch of time reporting in the region. I I actually haven't been to Gaza, but I've, I've been all around Israel and I've been all around the West Bank and I've met with Palestinian authority leaders. I've met with Americans. I've met with Israeli officials. What Biden is doing, what Antony Blinken did on his quick trip to the region, first of all, this was not a front burner issue for the administration. The tinderbox or powder keg that blew up could have blown up when Trump was in office. It could have totally disrupted the Abraham Accords. It didn't. It was Uh, the fourth war between Israel and Hamas. Yeah, and I think there was a lot of pent-up Palestinian frustration about how the Trump administration supported the Israeli right. However, I don't blame the blow up on the Trump administration. I think you have to, I try to focus on the positives and and the Abraham Accords, which were normalization. You got to remember a lot of Arab countries in the region don't recognize Israel. Anti-Semitism is part of that. This is a problem in the Middle East, even in 2021. So the Abraham Accords were this ability of the Trump administration to to get normalization between a small number of uh, Arab powers and Israel. It is somewhat historic. What Biden's team is trying to do is to show that there could and should be some sort of peace talks between the Palestinians and the Israelis. The problem is they, they haven't really done anything new at all. Uh, and, and this is actually where Trump deserves and got some credit, even from the middle in the U.S., which was that uh, his administration tried to do something new. You know, Anthony Blinken deserves credit himself for showing up at just after this delicate ceasefire was struck and going to both sides in the same day, going around the Israeli side, meeting with Benjamin Netanyahu, the Israeli political situation is very chaotic. So we have to get into that. He may sure he might be out. soon. He might be. But I mean, he hasn't been able to form a government for years and yet continues to just squeak by in election after an election that gets held and cling to power. So Anthony Blinken met with Benjamin Netanyahu, but he also met with the Israeli opposition And then he also ran across the border into Ramallah and the West Bank and met with Mahmoud Abbas and really showed that an American could meet with both sides in a single day. That's something that really didn't happen publicly. It happened privately all the time in the Trump era, but it never it didn't happen on that public diplomatic level. So he deserves credit for that. The problem is that he can't meet with Hamas because Hamas is registered or designated by the U.S. State Department as a terrorist organization. It's also recognized by the State Department's most recent country reports on terrorism 2019 that Iran supplies uh, weapons to and support for Hamas and that Iran continues to be listed as a state sponsor of terrorism. So he has no relationship with Hamas publicly. And Hamas controls Gaza and the rockets that were fired to Israel were from Gaza. So the Biden administration's approach is reactionary. It's we've got this back burner issue that became front burner. We don't have a solution. And we've shown up to try to meet with both sides, but we can't meet with the Mm -hmm. element of one side that's firing the rockets. And our solution is that the Palestinian Authority, all the aid that goes to to fix Gaza is going to go through this Palestinian Authority. This is we've tried this before. Hamas doesn't respect the Correct. So so you got a problem here and I think they recognize that before we do something new, let's show up on the scene and deliver the rhetoric of peace and human rights. It's it's a difficult, intractable problem. The premise of my question was all U.S. administrations pretty much since 1948 have been pro-Israel. This one is as well, by the way. Of course. I mean, the core talking point for anyone listening was Israel has a right to defend itself. I think I will emphasize, you know, one of the things we I've tried with my team to cover 
without editorializing is just look at the facts. The U.S. State Department lists Hamas as a terrorist organization. The U.S. State Department also lists Palestinian Islamic Jihad. They call it the PIDG in the U.S. intelligence community as a terrorist organization. And yeah, people can say, well, it's wrong. Well, call on the State Department to delist them then. Find, have the congressional hearings required and do that. But right now, that's where the law is. And it's the same with Iran being declared as a state sponsor of terrorism. So the Biden administration can say, we're going to try and help the Palestinians. But at some point, you have this elephant in the room, okay. which is that part of the Palestinian cause is controlled by uh Hamas. Well, let's talk about Iran now. The United States has not had normal relations with Iran since 1979, but that hasn't stopped past presidents from trying to work with Iran at certain times. Ronald Reagan got into some trouble over that. And Barack Obama, the 2015 nuclear accord that Donald Trump pulled out of. So how is Obama's former vice president, now the president, Joe Biden, doing when it comes to restoring that deal? They're trying. They want to put diplomacy first. And uh, well, what are the obstacles? Maybe that's the right question. Yeah. The obstacle is that they're trying to negotiate with the Iranians and the Iranians are, are going into, um, despite it being a theocratic dictatorship, there is a, a election process. Yeah, there's a mixed constitution. A, a, a kind of democracy that, that goes on there. And they have June 18 elections. So you know, while the the biggest Iran hawks in the U.S. will say these elections are a total sham, and, and there's lots of evidence to back that up, the reality is they're going to have a transition of presidential power uh, next month, this month, sorry. So it's coming in a few weeks, right? That's right. And, it is June already. That's right. So we've got, I, I'm harping on this because the Biden administration can come in with its initiative and say, we're going to negotiate with the Iranians. We're going to get their government to do this and that. And we're going to try to convince them to stop enriching uranium towards making nuclear bombs again. And we're even going to promise that we'll ease sanctions again and we'll reenter the nuclear deal. We'll, we'll clean up this mess that the Trump administration made with pulling out of the, the nuclear deal, whether you agreed with it or not. And, and that's Biden's approach. The problem is we don't know where the Iranians are on this. And all the signs we're seeing is that the Iranians have increased their backing for militant proxies in Yemen in Lebanon, in Syria, in Israel, where we just talked about the blow up from Hamas. They've also increased their uh, ballistic missiles program, which the United States spent years trying to get UN Security Council members to sign on to say that the Iranian government was violating international norms with this program anyway. So the Iranians haven't really shown yet that they want to participate. So right now, the policy is struggling. It's struggling to really get anywhere. So I guess at this early stage, a less confrontational relationship between the two countries is, is not in the offing? I think we have to see what happens. This is why I With keep saying that, that while Biden has announced this idealistic policy, he's really in reaction mode. Even though he's tried to get out in front and say, we're going to put diplomacy first. We want to get talks going. We've got the parties of the JCPOA, the 2015 nuclear deal, together. That's happening even though the U.S. and the Iranians aren't, aren't in the same room. Mm -hmm. But really, the policy is being dictated by Iran at this point. They're having elections. There are events in the region that they have are affecting more than we are. And Biden is kind of stuck reacting to that. Well, to my point about presidents inheriting, if not a mess, simply responsibilities for any number of situations across the world. And uh, Iran's influence in that region has been exponentially enhanced by the disappearance of Saddam Hussein's Iraq. I think also if you flip this around, Martin, and you say, well, what did the Trump team inherit when they came yeah. in in 2016, and they inherited a newly inked nuclear deal that involved a windfall of sanctions relief for the Iranian regime. And they came in and immediately sent signals to the Iranians and said, you know, we don't like how you're spending this money on proxy wars in the region. There was a, a large disagreement between the two sides about this that ultimately led to this very debatable and controversial move by former President Donald Trump, which was, I'm going to trash the 2015 nuclear deal and pull the U.S. out of it. 
while there were critics, there were also supporters who said the Iranians got the windfall of cash from sanctions relief tied to the JCPOA in 2015, and they just used it to fund violence and proxy groups around the region. Is that accurate? I think parts of that are very true, especially if you look at the birth of basically a new Hezbollah movement in neighboring Iraq, where the U.S. is pulling out and the Iranians are trying to take over an element of Iraqi society that may have otherwise been or should have otherwise been part of the Iraqi military. It's now a Shia militia uh, that's funded, backed by Iran. And if you're looking for a reason why the U.S. intelligence community supported the idea of using a drone strike to kill the commander of Iran's basically special forces that oversaw the training of Iraqi Hezbollah, Qasem Soleimani. Uh, Assassinated. With a drone strike in, in Baghdad, specifically because he was overseeing a program that was dividing the Iraqi security forces and making a huge element of them run by the Iranian government. Okay, that is Iran. We will move on now from the greater Middle East and go to China. Guy Taylor. Arguably, we could have started with China because it is the biggest geopolitical challenge facing the United States right now. And a story that is back in the news, the origins of the coronavirus. So a year ago, talk that the virus escaped from a lab in Wuhan was considered conspiratorial crazy talk. Well, it turns out President Biden is asking the intelligence community to look into this again, right? Yeah, I mean, this is a this is a real challenge for Biden. You know, the Biden administration does want to get to the bottom of of the origins of COVID-19 so that we can, uh, as a human species, we can study uh, this and figure out how to guard against it going forward. At the same time, there's a desire and a well-rooted need to maybe try to own the narrative on this and win a PR victory. You're talking about information war at this point. You're talking about this disease that starts in a country that's got an extremely secretive government, doesn't have a First Amendment, doesn't have a free press, doesn't have freedom of information, appears to have arrested scientists who tried to speak out about how there was a need for an investigation, appears to have used economic muscle to bully the World Health Organization in its own investigation. All of these things, and and where is the United States in this, especially as China's economy continues to be close to eclipsing that of the United States on the world stage. And the Chinese are going around investing in countries, making partners, saying, turn a blind eye to our style of government, yeah. actually embrace it if, if you want. Belt and road. And, right? and so the challenge for Biden is how big of an issue do you want to make this COVID-19 investigation? And I think there are signs that Biden wants to make it because he knows there's in, there is incentive to, to show the world that the United States wants to get to the truth. Well, think about the international implications, right? If, in fact, this came out of a lab... We're talking about the deaths of three million people, Mm -hmm. millions more sickened, and essentially the world turned upside down for a year and a half. I don't know that I I want to fan the flames of let's let's blame somebody for we don't know yet this virus. Yeah. Even if we do find out, I, I think the issue is can this be used to show another very influential world power of the need for there to be some element of transparency when it comes to things like scientific research, yes. and that's really what it comes down to. When when we then go into the politics side, if we start at geopolitics. What the Biden administration is facing is the same issue that the Trump administration was facing, which is whether or not the United States media wants to embrace this or not. Remember, the United States media, including Hollywood and all of the newspapers and all of the television networks, are all making the companies that own them are all making some money in China quite a bit. So there's a, an aversion to criticizing how things are done in China at the moment. At the same time, the Chinese economy is big. The, the European Union, for instance, China has eclipsed the U.S. as the biggest trading partner for the European wow. Union. It's barely reported. It's reported in the British press. It's out there. It's known. And to push the Chinese around isn't going to happen, which is why Biden has, has gotten behind this idea of the quad. Let's align militarily with the biggest democracies in the world, in that part of the world, Japan, Australia, India. Let's see if we can get some coordination among them 
to make sure that global trade can continue the way that it, it does, that there isn't an attempt by one massive power in Asia to s- sort of rewrite the rules about how goods move around the world, things like this. So that's what you meant by Biden being hesitant to push China around instead of being confrontational try to work collaboratively with the other nations. Yeah, I also think that the American foreign policy transcends administrations. We have a pluralistic multi-party system here. I know there's a lot of biting politics uh, all the way down to the street level in this country. But at the end of the day, the China policy transcends. It's, it's going to be here when Biden's gone. It was here before he got here. Donald Trump went about it a different way. It was very much more confrontational. It was not warmongering. It was it was just sending a very clear message to this other organization of people on the planet who have a really different way of doing government that the United States has some principles. And some of these principles involve don't steal intellectual property. Don't violate human rights at a level where you're setting up concentration camps for people who are, are Muslim. Well, this you know? was an area where Democrats and Republicans agreed. The calling out of China, the cheating on trade, international property or intellectual property. So one premise of this podcast is how events, possibly unforeseen, maybe not, shape presidencies. And often presidencies succeed or fail based on how our leaders deal with something. Taiwan, an issue that could potentially pull the United States into a military confrontation with China, even though Taiwan is not a formal ally of ours. I don't think a lot of Americans believe saving Taiwan's autonomy is worth a war, Mm -hmm. but uh, American foreign policy sometimes is based on credibility, right? Standing up for an ally to show our other allies that we're in their corner. Absolutely. And, you know, I've been to Taiwan twice. Take Uh, me with you next time. It looks like a... Yeah. It's it's an amazing place. It's one of the uh, original drivers of this current moment of economic dynamism across East Asia. I don't want to reduce Taiwan to a geopolitical chess piece, but there's a lot of history here. I mean, you you could go back to the Chinese Revolution and Mao Zedong and and Chiang Kai Shek, and you can look at you know the Taiwan Straits crises of the uh, 1950s and realize that just maybe a decade after the United States had dropped two nuclear bombs in the region, the only two, right, uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, yes. and sent a really clear message to every government in Asia. So after the communist revolution in China, Mao Zedong's revolutionaries wanted to uh, take the anti-communists in Taiwan from the start. So you had the Taiwan Straits crises, right? The United States at that time stood up for Taiwan. This is the early 1950s. This is important because it was from that conflict, and there's consensus on this, that Mao Zedong realized—I mean, the United States made it clear we could use nuclear weapons. Stop, you know, back off. We support this group in Taiwan. That's right. And Mao Zedong then became determined to develop China's nuclear program. In this way, Taiwan became this geopolitical chess piece at that time. China turned to the Soviet Union for help building its nuclear program. My point in all of this is that these geopolitics are still there. China is using this the, the Taiwan issue to bait the United States to, you know, where, where are the limits? Are you going to, to come a little bit closer? You know, are, are you really going to stand up? Can we do, are you going to send aircraft carrier through? Are you going to, how close are we to a, a clash here? Look at how much stronger the Chinese military is now than it was in the 1950s in the Taiwan Straits crisis. That's why Taiwan is there. And Biden is being briefed on this stuff. He knows about it, and we're writing about it uh, in the Washington Times. I'm covering it. I can't emphasize enough, Biden's approach so far, out of the gate in the first 100 days, was to hold the first ever head of state meeting of the Quad. Japan, Australia, India, United States. These are all Pacific powers. They're all stable democracies. They all have advanced militaries, even though there's the caveat of Japan having constitutional issues with its military because it's a pacifist nation. 
I think a good question for Biden is, would Taiwan be part of the Quad Plus that gets talked about? Would South Korea be part of the Quad Plus? So Taiwan is there. I, I don't anticipate that China is about to take it. And I think you, you'll find, a, if you were to get a, a bunch of Navy commanders, on U.S. Navy commanders on here, in our experience reporting on it, they're harder line about this than the people on, on Biden's NSC. They want the U.S. to flex its muscles more in this, this theater. When I had you on the podcast mm-hmm. uh, several weeks ago to talk about China, the other guest on that episode was Carla Freeman mm. of the uh, Johns Hopkins School mm-hmm. of Advanced International Studies. And she said that there is growing concern that China may move on Taiwan sooner rather than later. There's some consensus on that. That consensus has made its way in and out of the Pentagon. So the Pentagon updates its annual assessment on China and provides it to the White House and to Congress. And in the latest one, that was a gentle nuance of the assessment, was that China might be able to take Taiwan or might might attempt to faster than we thought. So, you know, that Publicly, it, that's yeah. China's position, right? I think so. I mean, I, I think that there's, you know, again, despite it being an authoritarian communist country, that it's not monolithic. There are very biting debates about this in China among the power elite. No question. How hard should should China be pushing on Taiwan? How What will the United States do? If you were to have a moment of political chaos that lasted years in the United States, that might present China with an opportunity to do something like take Taiwan. Okay, let's move on to Russia, shall we? A summit is coming up, Joe Biden and Vladimir Putin. And uh, when I saw that news, I was actually surprised to see a summit being held already. And I spotted a headline line saying Russia wants to send uncomfortable signals to the United States beforehand. It's so interesting because with the exception of a small number of years at the end of the Cold War, where there appeared to be uh, a lot of unity between the two sides, it's been a rocky relationship. And, and then in the Putin era, which has been like most of our lifetimes, right? I mean, he's been in power, I think, more than 20 years at this point. And goes back to Clinton. So we, we've got this really contentious relationship. At the same time, we have trade and a uh, lot of Russians in the United States, uh, American business in, in Russia. We have a diplomatic relationship. During the, the last 20 years, though, the landscape of places where the two sides, which have this long Cold War Uh, historical relationship of how they behave towards each other, the landscape technologically has changed. You know, for instance, at the end of the Cold War, we didn't have a cyber realm. We now have the cyber realm and elements of Russian intelligence backing uh, bigger and bigger hacking operations against the United States for clients around the world and for their own meddling purposes to show the world and the United States that Russia is still a viable geopolitical power. And mm. and so this is something that Biden's got to deal with. And I think the task for Biden is to try and make it clear to Putin that uh, Russian threats and provocations like hacking are not going to result in anything other than more sanctions from Washington. And and I think for Putin going into this, his challenge is to show Biden that he really has proof that the U.S. meddles in in uh, the affairs of former Soviet republics like Belarus. He's got this proof and he really wants the U.S. to stop. And he's he needs to convey somehow to Biden, you know, not to try and foment a revolution against him in Russia. That's what's going to go on behind the scenes, that conversation. But there's another, again, right. to use this term, elephant in the room, which is China. And and it's been in, in the interest. Uh, we've written this a couple of times. It's in the interest of U.S. intelligence, or so so our sources tell us that to try and drive a wedge between Moscow and Beijing. And I, I think that's something that will also be going on behind the scenes. Is this kind of attempt by uh, Biden to say to Putin, "Look, I've been around a while. We don't we, we don't need to be at war." Uh, we need to recognize that there's this other power that has immense economic influence now. Why don't we work together a little bit? Yeah, Joe Biden is arguably the most experienced foreign policy president upon taking office. I mm-hmm. mean, I believe he was the chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, mm-hmm. vice president who worked on foreign policy 
under Obama. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump's affinity for Vladimir Putin was peculiar, to say the least. What is Joe Biden's relationship with Putin? Um, do they, do yeah, they have a relationship? Yeah, they've met uh, a couple of times when Biden was vice president. I think that they... Biden has to has the issue here of being a four a four year president. What we've seen now with Putin, who is really like a czar, right? He's been in power for uh, longer than any democratically elected leader in the world, including Angela Merkel. And I, I think if if I'm Putin going into this summit, I'm saying, you know, uh, Joe, President Biden, you you've got about three years left. Maybe you get another four years, but you know, what, do you, what, what do you want to do right now? Really, you, you think know? it's going to be that, uh, that shrewd? It, it could be. I mean, that's what's going to give Putin his, his kind of leverage. As far as uh, Trump's uh, affinity, you know, I look at Trump's affinity for strongman leaders. I mean, that was just something that Came emanated— in North Korea. Yeah, but I also look at maximum pressure against North Korea and sanctions during the Trump era, a, a desire to try something new, to say, hey, the status quo of, of this kind of, kind of small multilateral attempt at diplomacy with re this regime and its successor regime hasn't worked. Why don't we try top-down summits? You know, Trump's perfect for that. He's the deal maker. Get him, you know. Same uh, or or not, whatever. It's something new. That's my point. And I think then you look at Trump's affinity for Putin and you say, well, the U.S. increased sanctions dramatically during the Trump era on Russian officials. That's true. In response to a variety of things. So it's not just a, a throwaway line like, oh, Trump well, pandered he, he, to Putin. They had an awkward press conference where there were massive allegations from American media that have never been proven that somehow Putin and Trump were in bed together or metaphorically. Well, in the, bed Helsinki, together. the Helsinki the Helsinki meeting yeah. uh, was when Trump publicly, with Putin standing right there, disagreed with the findings of his own intelligence community that Russia meddled in the 2016 election. I think that's what was. Yeah, I mean, I would go back and look at the transcript and see how full-throatedly Trump disagreed with it. I think at the end of the day, he didn't stand up and say, Mr. Putin, I've got an intelligence report here that says you meddled in our election. And my hunch is that even if Trump had done that, the story in Washington would have been... Donald Trump didn't stand up to Putin. Well, as you know, international relations don't have to be antagonistic 100% of the time. The criticism of Donald Trump, however, was that he didn't seem to understand, whatever his relationship was with Vladimir Putin, that Russia was hostile to the United States. Why was he not? Why was Trump then not blocking sanctions on Russia then? I, I think we could drill a little closer into this and say, like, well, Trump uh, gave a lot of lip service to stopping Nord Stream 2, which is a Russian gas pipeline into to Germany, Germany yeah. essentially, uh, but never actually stopped it and kind of used, kicked it down the road. Now Biden has come in and also said he doesn't want to stop it. And so uh, there are some big energy companies that are going to make money on, on this, and it's going to hand uh, leverage to Moscow, basically, and state-owned Russian oligarch-owned companies that decide how much natural gas goes through this pipeline to a whole slate of countries, not just Germany and the EU. Uh, so that that's there. Look, Trump allowed that. Biden's allowed that. I mean, I think there's also an element of how the power elite in the former Soviet Union get their money and keep it. And the way that the governments that allow that to continue, are they stable or is the United States trying to undercut them? Whether it's the Putin government or the Lukashenko government in Belarus or name a government that no one in the U.S. can remember the names of the leaders of. The point is, is Biden, what is he going to message does he want to send? And can he get anywhere with Vladimir Putin, who's got a government that's essentially supporting a handful of strong men, leaders around the region? Putin stays in power by keeping the elites in Russian society Martin, satisfied. I think it would behoove us, and this is what my mission is at the Washington Times, is why I'm at this newspaper, is to try to focus the conversation away from politics and focus it on I'll say just take it to the tier of geopolitics. The United States, Afghanistan is a lot closer to Russia than it is to the U.S. mainland, right? 
The United States has been in Afghanistan for 20 years. It's pulling out right now. That probably means something to the Russians, especially because uh, the Russians occupied Afghanistan before the United States did. Yes, and and that it opens the way for geopolitical jiggering over who will be the next sort of outside power that tries to influence the events in Afghanistan, a country with pretty massive natural resources that are in a tricky location under big mountains, natural gas, uh, copper, things that will be needed to be wanted by the powers of the future. You know, do the United States and Russia come together on this or do they fight with each other over politics and hacking? That's a, that's I think a good the, point. The, this is the pitch that I think Biden makes to Putin. There are other geopolitical factors uh, in the region as well, such as shipping and the movement of uh, oil to the region from the Middle East through the sea lines of communication and China's desire to control these things, right? So you could make the argument that uh, if Russia were not hell-bent on supplying natural gas to Europe, or even if it were, perhaps Russia could uh, help supply more natural gas and other fuels to uh, East Asia. But if the current paradigm is, is that China increasingly controls the flow or the movement of oil from the Middle East to the region, where's Russia in that? Do they need, do they have a partner? The Russians are also doing things in the Arctic. You know, we report on this on a regular basis. And I wanted to ask you about that sure. as well with the ice melt in the Arctic Circle. Russia is building up bases, naval bases, right. air bases. It certainly seems that way. I mean, there, there's... American military reporting about this, and there's a, a, a kind of releases from the Pentagon and the U.S. intelligence community about uh, how this one base that the Russians have in the Arctic has become really permanent in the last couple of years. I'm talking. I'm not talking about like oh, a ship went in and parked, and and some guys got off and set up tents. I mean, there are actually permanent structures there now, and what well, will be an airstrip and and docking stations and. This is a big deal because really no other power on earth has done this. It's not clear the Chinese have done this. The United States has really struggled with it. We've struggled to have our government finance uh, even ships that can get up and cut through the ice. I think we've got two. And uh, Well, soon in the summer you won't need anything to cut through the ice because in the summertime there won't be ice. Possibly. Yeah, yeah. possibly. I mean, yeah, that's, that's the premise here. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, the idea is that global warming results in melted Arctic uh, passageways and it sort of change, changes the shipping routes of the world. Again, this is another one with a lot of ifs, uh, not so much on the climate science as geopolitically. I mean, if it becomes suddenly viable to pass container ships through the Arc Arctic, then will the Russians be beating the Americans by having a base there? Will this matter if the U.S. gets along with the government in the Kremlin? <laughs> you know, that's another question. So, uh, well, it's in the interests of both sides to improve relations. I think it is. I think so. And I think that the question going into the Biden Putin summit is does Putin agree with that? Guy Taylor, thank you. Guy Taylor, Washington Times National Security Team Leader. We look forward to reading your coverage of the summit and everything else we've been talking about here. We're going to have you back soon. On the next episode of History As It Happens. For much too long, the history of what took place here was told in silence, cloaked in darkness. But just because history is silent, it doesn't mean that it did not take place. How should we confront the ugly parts of our past? What should we teach our kids about racism and slavery? As the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa massacre focuses our attention once more on the need for a reckoning. That's next as we report History As It Happens, a podcast from The Washington Times.